Welcome to Celebrating Act 2. Celebrating Act 2 is the user manual for the second half of your life. Welcome to another episode of Celebrating Act 2. John Coleman and I are here to speak with Manny Pacheco, the purveyor of the forgotten Hollywood brand. Hello, guys. Manny, good to see you. Well, I'm happy to be back. Um, you know, I, I'm always taken by the fact that the three of us are of the first television generation. We really grew mm. up with television. And yet here we are talking about feature films, the history of movies, which we all love. It's a, They're two different mediums in, in a sense. But uh, a couple of weeks ago or whenever it was, we, we were talking about um, that era that, that after the post-World War II, when television started uh, encroaching, if you will, on Hollywood, um, it was a really unique time. And it, it was a bad time for the movies, as I recall, because they were trying to find out how they could compete with um, television. My recollection is this, that television, di they were dying for content. They couldn't afford to make their own content. Mm -hmm. And so what the first thing they did is they bought old movies and they bought cheap cartoons. You know, the, the mouse going by the same tree every <laughs> two seconds. Um, that was what television was. And it scared the daylights out of the, out of the, um, the movie theaters because the movie theaters and, and the movie studios didn't know what to do with these old films. They sold them off willingly, and yet they became their own competition. Mm -hmm. And I think um, that was, it wasn't too long. It wasn't Disney one of the first to produce new, uh, new and large entertainment for television, yeah. original entertainment for television. Yeah. yeah, but that came a little bit later. There were some factors that went into stuff. Let me first say a couple of things that you, you based on what you just said. Encroachment was the right word. There was a beautiful collaboration between radio and the films in the 1920s. They could turn their movies into radio productions, make them shorter. People still go to the movies. They could use radio as a way to get people to go to the movies. This, these were the movie moguls. And so radio was- You're yeah. talking about things like the Green Hornet and things like that, or uh, oh, some of the- absolutely. And I'm talking about taking productions like The Best Years of Our Lives or uh -huh. It's a Wonderful Life and bringing the actors from the movies to star in the radio productions of the same film on radio. Rebecca, another one that was that comes to mind. So, uh, but when television came along, it was seen as an encroachment. That was the perfect word, John. That was absolutely perfect. And and you were right; they were buying things. But what really scared the movie studios wasn't really that package of cartoons or those morning, car, uh, you know, children's shows. What really scared the uh, the movie studios was the um, when they televised wrestling. <laughs> really? Wrestling was so popular that That's people were staying home for, for wrestling. Wow. So, mm. um, the, the movie moguls did not like television. They were going to do everything they can to make sure the television failed. When television asked for the rights to put the Oscars on, uh, on the small screen, uh, they were denied. Yeah. But a number of factors came along because TV was struggling from 1947 to 1950. It was struggling. It was not many homes had televisions. Right. They were all really small. I mean, yeah. Really oh, sure. Screens. Yeah. And really, uh, one person who could have made a dent died early, and that was Robert Ripley. Uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not. He had produced 13 uh, television programs, and he was very popular. But then he died. And so there went the television uh, age of the 1940s. We get into the 1950s, and a number of factors uh, took place, and the movie moguls were defeated. There was just nothing they could do. And where it begins is a very unlikely source. It begins in the <clears throat> August of 1951, when the Dodgers are 13 and a half games ahead of the Giants. This is the New York Giants and the Brooklyn Dodgers. And somehow in those six short weeks, the Giants caught the Dodgers, forced a three-game series. They decided that television decided, this is great content. Let's put the playoffs on television. So that when the shot heard round the world, that home run that was hit, you know, Branca's the home run, 
Sure. Uh, Bobby Thompson. Uh, that captured the imagination of the audience. And yeah. they were saying, oh my gosh, we got to get television. That, that, that actually moved the market in such a way that people had to have televisions. At the same time, there was uh, the actors were in unison, lockstep with the movie moguls. They were not going to cross over the line to make small screen content. But one actor defied the movie moguls and decided to make their own product. And because it was such a new thing, they were given really full reign in how that product should be uh, created. And one of the things that she decided to do was to include her Cuban husband. And when I Love Lucy premiered, oh. Monday, Mondays became must-see TV. Uh, stores closed early. Uh, restaurants closed early. Yeah. As people were home after they had bought their TV sets because of the shot heard around the world, and yeah. they started watching I Love Lucy in droves. And, and also, I remember, I remember that uh, we talked about that. And I was in school at the time. And you would talk about that afterwards because there was no DVRs. There was no right. period. Okay, there was no binge watching. Okay, if you, you missed Monday you miss night, if you missed Monday night, you were out of sync with the rest of the world. What do they call yeah. that? The water cooler talk. It was, yeah. and there I were a whole number of shows missed, like that. You could always hope for the rerun six months later. So. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> but you know, I, I I gotta interrupt just for a second. I remember um, when you mentioned uh, uh, the fact that the television actually reduced some movie going ticket sales i remember friday night fights do you remember that yeah uh, brought to you by gillette look yeah. good and uh, da, 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 feel good i remember friday night fights um actually people stayed home to watch that live because yeah. all television was live right so yeah if you didn't see it then you couldn't replay it you couldn't watch it back the next day yeah. And I remember that really cut into movie sales on Friday night because what was fr the movies was a Friday night date or a Saturday night date. Yeah, sports was a real bonanza for television. But then there was a, a couple of other things that happened that we didn't expect. And one was that a, a war hero was going to decide to run for president. Oh, when yeah. White Eisenhower decided that he was going to run. And, and nobody knew if he was going to be a Democrat or a Republican at the time. That, I mean, yeah, they both voted him. The party. Yep. <laughs> and so that became a real boon for television because, it, 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 you know, we already had stars in Edward R. Murrow. But Edward R. Murrow's handpicked uh, uh, team in, that included Walter Cronkite and, of course, the rivals, which included Huntley and Brinkley, th they became stars because they were they were putting the conventions on live television and sure. they proved to be really popular. Yeah. So the conventions also, again, live, uh, became the and when and then, of course, when Eisenhower was selected as the nominee for the Republicans in 1952, that I mean, television was really on its way. But then there was one more thing, <clears throat> maybe, excuse me. Um, and that was the sudden death of King George in England, oh. which set the stage for set the stage for the coronation of Queen Elizabeth. Yes. Mm. Yep. And and of course. The coronation t carried live in 1953, and by by 1953, it was the writing was on the wall. Uh, movies were not now thinking how to compete with um, with um, with television by by trying to avoid them. They were going to do something different, and they started creating the epic. You know, that's where in 1953 is where you start seeing movies like The Robe and R Ivan. Lawrence of Arabia. Oh. North yeah, these Arabia. big epic films. Yeah, in Cinemascope, Vista Vision. You know, these yes. So let me ask you this, Man Manny. I seem to remember that, uh, and it's uh, somewhere in this area, is that once they figured out how, to, so they couldn't beat TV, but they could figure out how to monetize it. And forgetting about all the things that have happened subsequently, I remember there was uh, on NBC and uh, ABC for sure. And there's probably CBS. There was a Friday night at the movies or Monday night where they got the the uh, somewhat edited version of what was in the theaters probably some not right. simultaneously but some years later and uh, many of us never got to go to all of those movies for sure so it was like a must-see for those nights of the week where you actually got to see a feature film 
And I guess that's where they started monetizing it. Yeah, and and then, the then they went into production. Every major studio had a TV production on them. Yeah, and then you also had the fabulous 52 or the million dollar movie where they show the same movie every mm -hmm. night for a week. I, yeah. I, you're right, but the, but the real monetization came when finally the movie moguls agreed to allow the Academy Awards to air on television. And th that was by 1952, 53. But there was one other thing that really cemented television, and of course that was the McCarthy hearings, the Army the McCarthy, Army McCarthy hearings. hearings. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah and, and you know, with, with Judge Welsh, you know, really, you know, talking down McCarthy and destroying his career on live television. So, I mean, we went a long way from wrestling to the Army McCarthy hearings, but really all of those factors happened in the space of just about, you know, two and a half, three years. And they were all big deals. Yeah. And, you know, I mean, and, and if you want to know how big a deal the coronation is, Queen Elizabeth is still alive. Right. <laughs> I mean, at least and, at this tape at this taping, she's still alive. Now, does yeah, she owe that to her, television? Yeah. Is that because of television? No, she, she's alive because she's got good genes. I don't know oh. what you're talking about. <laughs> well, there seems to be a connection. I don't think television kept her alive, but you know. Well, you, you know, Manny, what I find alive. fascinating about this is the, as you described it, um, how this movie studios, the movie industry reacted instead of trying to fight them head to head and recognizing they can't fight live sports and things like that um how they created the blockbusters yes and and created events that you had to go to yes and one other thing happened too and i, I would be remiss if i didn't mention this stars emerged from television and they became screen stars Yes. You get, you end up with, you know, Eva Marie Saint and and uh, Joanne Woodward and Paul Newman, and Rod Steiger and Eli Wallach. I mean, they all came from television. These were actors that were, you know, that were not getting a break from the studios, yes. and so you were you were getting television actors. Maximilian Schell doing his version of Judgment at Nuremberg on television, and then of course being cast in the film. Yeah. A Requiem for a Heavyweight made a star of Rod Serling as a writer, as yeah. uh, a number of movies, a, a number of television shows that were written by Patty Chayefsky. So the writers became important as well. And they migrated to better television deals or in Patty Chayefsky's case, into movie deals where he yeah. became a writer for movies. So, yeah, yeah you, you ended up now pilfering. And of course, the most celebrated the, the, where it really cemented and it all came to fruition was that little television program where Rod Steiger plays a butcher and then they make a movie out of it with now Ernest Borgnine as that butcher and Marty wins the best picture of the year. Wow. And there, I there, didn't, you know, I didn't know that stuff. Marty started out as a TV show. Yeah. Very as did 12 Angry Men, Requiem for a Heavyweight, Patterns. Uh, there was just a number of them, yeah. 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 Judgment at Nuremberg, they were all uh, based on teleplays, so yeah. Well, what an interesting time uh, for what we now call media. Yeah, and we're going through it right now again. I mean, you know, with, with streaming versus sure. films. Well, I mean, that's going to be, hold on, cycle. John, cycle. John, it's the keeper of all things future. So write that down, John. We've got to go into the current state of affairs of how everybody's trying to survive post-pandemic, okay, in the theaters and will they ever be back and blah, blah, blah. So uh, this has been a great walk down uh, memory lane into the world of Hollywood that's been forgotten by a lot of people. And we thank you, Manny, for bringing us up to date. Well, in my books, I really do try to match history in Hollywood. So this discussion we had today was exactly if you if you like this kind of discussion, you you would love my forgotten Hollywood. You books know what? Let's do. You know, we don't often do a shameless plug that's always in the in the credits underneath. Uh, but let's do an official shameless plug. If people want to know more about all of your other work and your wonderful archives and uh, links to all the fabulous books that you've written so they can acquire them for their very own library. How might they do that? Forgotten Hollywood, Forgotten History, Son of Forgotten Hollywood, Forgotten History, and Road to Forgotten Hollywood, Forgotten History, all available on Amazon. And but, of course, my blog is at www.forgottenhollywood.com. And of course, Manny, we would be remiss if we didn't mention the fact that today, Hollywood includes television. Hollywood includes streaming. 
Hollywood includes pay TV. Hollywood, it's all, it's all Hollywood now. Yes, even this program yes. is Hollywood. For more on Celebrating Act Two, visit our webpage, follow us on Facebook, subscribe to us on YouTube, and tell your friends. Celebrating Act Two is the user manual for the second half of your life.